And uh, we work very closely with uh, Kaseya, the one of our cybersecurity backup partners. Uh, we're very fortunate today to have Jason with us. Um, Jason, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and about the company that you've been doing this presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Jason Price, I am what we call a channel uh, development manager. Essentially, I travel all over the country, more than I like to admit. <laughs> and I, I, I go to and sit through these presentations and participate in these presentations and talk about you know, things from cybersecurity, the landscape, different frameworks. Um, my company, you know, as, as Roland mentioned, we do everything from backup solutions, we do um, you know, a bunch of different types of security or components of cybersecurity stacks. Um, and it's all the, the different tool sets that they use to help make sure that, that you guys are protected. Um, and it, it's tough going after FBI agent, right? They have all the credibility in the world. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, oh, you say another thing that I want to talk about. Oh, and another thing. And I'm scared to answer because like, if I get it wrong, then I'm like, yeah, I have the credibility. So. I we're all on the same page. <laughs> There's so much pressure now, all right, guys? <laughs> but I'm going to try. Um, so the first thing I want to just uh, show is this picture that we have right here. Uh, this is me just driving on the highway. And I said, oh, this is a cool picture. But what I wanted to, to show with this is that when you're driving the car, where are you looking? Done, like, done. I'm done with that. It's a country Right? So it's some people are looking so some people are looking at the, the, the Dunkin' Donuts cup. Yeah. Right? Some people are looking at maybe the, the front of the hood. Yeah. And then some people may be looking like a quarter mile down the road. Mm -hmm. Is there a better place? What's the be where's the best place to be looking when driving on a highway? Oh, yeah, yeah, quarter mile down the road, right? Yes. Yeah. It's not the kid in the back seat. It's not the radio. It's a quarter mile down the road, right? Because you're able to see what's coming and be able to act accordingly, make adjustments, mm -hmm. switch lanes, speed up, hit your brakes. But if you're looking at the cup, or you're looking at the front of the, the car, <laughs> you're, you're probably going to get an accident, right? Right. And so that's what, how I think about technology and technology landscape. If you're looking just like in the car or you know the rearview mirror, right? That's things like you know the, the old problems we used to talk about: accidental deletion, you know, a hardware failure, right? The blue screen of death, the, the hard drive fail, the natural disasters, right? Fires, floods, tornadoes. You want to make sure you're backing up or protecting your data. Then you have the end of the hood, right? So that's more things come to play now. That's when we started having the conversation around ransomware. We had the conversations about stricter regulations, you know, um, SaaS provider failures, right? But then if you look a quarter mile down the road, where does that leave you? What are the things that you need to see coming so you can adapt, change, pivot, um, to make sure that you prepare for that moment? So, I just want to go on a base level of security, right? So in your organizations, right, um, your, your businesses, you make sure the doors are locked, right? That's security, you make sure the windows are locked. If you're doing somebody's taxes and you mess up, what do you do with those, that, that paper? Shred. Shred it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking for, I have to make sure everybody's always like, uh. <laughs> Yes. Right? Um, file cabinets, right? So they're, they're locked, right? and you're in possession of that key. You don't have the lock and you don't just have a key hanging somewhere, right? Um, so that on a basic level is security. When we jump up or step up a level to like cybersecurity, people have a limited view of cybersecurity, right? You think about antivirus, right? That's something from like the 80s that is just ingrained in us, right? That we need to have antivirus, McAfee, Norton, whatever, whatever, whatever. Email security is coming bigger. More people are understanding that, hey, I need to secure my, my emails. Multi-factor authentication, it starts to become more normalized. It's the most annoying thing in the world. I know, we all know. It sucks when you want to get into something here and your phone's all the way over there and you have to go get your phone in order to get a thing that's over here, right? It sucks, but it worked, it's effective. Perimeter security, uh, even getting into this building today, I had to get a QR code, I had to go and scan my QR code in order for me to get access into the building, right? So these are things that have become more and more normalized. What's the next iteration? What's the court mile down the road? What other things should we be thinking about? Cyber resilience. Anybody want to take a stab 
of what being cyber resilient or what cyber resilience is. Okay. So cyber resilience is a measure of a business of a business trend to prepare for, operating through, and recovering from the eventuality of a cyber attack. So this is just preventing something coming into your system with the antivirus. This is saying that, hey, everything we do, you still have the possibility that there will be some sort of intrusion. However, how fast can you work through that? How resilient, resilient are you? How, much, how fast can you get back to normal operating procedure? Is it an hour? Is it a day? Are you down for a week, a month? And then you start thinking about what's that threshold of pain of being down for a week, a month? And does it change during the time of year? If it happens in March, is that worse off for you guys than it happening in like December? I don't know. I assume so because I know taxes are due in April. Right, so there's different like points of, of pressure at that point. So cyber resilience relies on the successful ability to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Essentially, what this is called, this is called the NIST framework. Anybody familiar with the NIST framework? No. Are you okay with this? You can. You photo? Oh yeah, you can take photos. Just make sure you get my good side. I also told them that they can send you the, the, the PDF version of this as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. if, yeah, so you don't have to worry about doing anything, but if you would like, please, please do so. Thank you. So, the NIST framework is one of many types of frameworks. Um, there's not one good framework that's better than the other, but there's some that's better for certain um, organizations, um, in, in certain verticals. So, identify, right? That's the first thing. When we talk about like risks to your organization, you want to identify what those risks may be. You want to identify all the different assets that you may have. You know, if, if we're talking about the physical building, the physical office, how many computers do you guys have? How many laptops do you guys have? How many, uh, you know, web cameras uh, or uh, security cameras do you guys have? Where, where are the locations? Uh, is there anything else? Get it, give me an awful Wi-Fi signal. These are things that you need to understand in order to be able to then protect. So you know what you have, you're able to now say, okay, we're gonna protect this, and if that means putting antivirus or something, uh, or this means, um, you know, um, making sure that you, you know, no longer just have files out in public and that they're in a specific room, you're protecting it via that physical barrier, that's what you're able to build. Then there's a mechanism to detect, right? Yes, I want to make sure that I have antivirus on my computer, but I need something to make sure that we're detecting any sort of anomalies, and if so, we need to be able to respond. And then once we respond, right, once we identify, once we uh, detect, once we respond, we're able to then recover and get back to normal. So I like this slide right here. Identify, once again, protect, detect, respond, recover. The first three are have to do more so with cybersecurity, right? Once you do this, it's all cybersecurity. These two right here, respond and recover, that is business continuity. That's what you do in terms of making sure that you don't have downtime, right? Because downtime is bad for business. Mm -hmm. I love this right here where it's technology, people, and process. In the beginning, when it's cybersecurity, when it's identify, protect, and detect, you're highly leveraging technology. So if you're working with, 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 with Impress, they'll give you a full stack of different tools, right? They'll give you the antivirus, they'll have uh, EDR, they'll have you know a backup, they'll have all these different things that they will deploy. That's highly leveraging technology. But as you get further down, you now have to leverage more people, right? The guys in the back of the room, the smart people, right? They have to go in and say, okay, there was an intrusion, there was an infection, there was ransomware. We needed to now respond and recover. That is a human element, the people element. But one thing that never wavers, nothing that ever changes throughout this whole thing are the processes that are outlined. The process is the process, you don't deviate from the process. The minute you deviate from a process, that's when things go downhill. 
Because at the end of the day, we're all waiting for this moment right here. That's that boom moment. That's when you walk into a room, you open up the computer, and then, as in that video, and it says $50,000 needed for your files, for you to get your files back, right? It's all anticipation for that. Because at that boom moment, right, when it's, time, when it's like, okay, what do we do? How do we do it? You know, what's the drill? Who do I call? Right? That is that, that, that resilient part where it's like, how fast or how long it, it, am I going to be down? How fast can I get back to being resilient? And it's all about here because prior to the boom, it could have been minutes or months that somebody was in your system, doing research on your system, research on you, figuring out you know, how to maneuver, figuring out what the, the plan of attack is going to be. Once they had that conversation, that boom moment, after that, it could be minutes to months to get back to normalcy, right? And it's all going to be dependent on your planning, your education, the tool sets that you have in place in order to make sure that you're as resilient as you possibly can be. So every single industry um, is susceptible to, to be tar uh, uh, targets of, of, of criminals, right? There are some that are more so at different times of year. For instance, healthcare during COVID, that was like the number one area that was affected by ransomware, by breaches, um, by you know spoofing because everybody was concerned about health, right? There's more activity going to those sites, there's more emails going out, people were working you know, remotely. It was just a, 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 a perfect catalyst to, for, for these criminals because of COVID. There are certain times of year, right, when there's more pressure, you know, because of your field, right? If you're a CPA, you need to make sure that, you know, whatever any of your documents are done is signed, you have to make sure that the you know corporate tax season is finished, the individual tax season is finished, whatever, all the things that you do that you know better than me, right? The criminals know what your timeline is as well. So you may see different peaks and valleys in terms of when there's more activity of them trying to infiltrate. Right, so one of the, the big things is that I've always heard is that people will say, I'm too small. Hmm. Nobody cares about my data, right? Who am I? I'm just, you know, a, a small time girl, small time guy, nobody cares about me. And you're right, they don't really care about you at all. <laughs> they, they care about how much your data means to you. I don't care about your data, but you, you, your kids, right? Your, your grandkids, right? Like, you, that's, that's all your pictures that you have of them, right? Because nobody prints out photos anymore, right? Yeah, imagine never seeing those again. You want those back, right? Mm -hmm. Give me ten thousand dollars, you can have your own pictures back. Because I don't want those. I don't care about the pictures. You like the pictures, and you can extend that to pretty much anything, right? Your your business stuff, your former returns, all of those things are things that they know that you care about. So why? Typically, in this room, you guys have probably the most valuable information out of any profession. Right, you have people's social security numbers, EIN numbers, account you have account account numbers. numbers, like you have everything. You guys are the perfect yeah, you guys are the perfect people to rob. I'm sorry. But you are. It's a dream. I can go up there and try to go and steal from, you know, a thousand different businesses, or I can just take a hundred of each one of your clients that equals a thousand businesses, and therefore I did that in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight in, 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 in eight attempts rather than try to rob a thousand people. Makes sense. You guys have the keys to the kingdom. You guys hold sensitive information. SMBs often lack strong cybersecurity defenses. Um, data is hosted in many locations. Anybody saving their data on a USB stick? A hard drive? She said not anymore after five minutes ago. <laughs> she called back to the office and said, pull it out now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. <laughs> and a, a compliance obligation, right? So they know that you have to keep data for a certain amount of time and there's going to be plenty of it, right? So there's different reasons um, why they want your data, right? And if you can't turn on the news without seeing a situation where a big major corporation company has been compromised. Anybody yeah. see this happen the other day? Yes, thank you. Yeah, people yeah. couldn't get into their rooms 
Imagine you have the MGM property in Vegas and you can't get into your room. You couldn't you, you can't even use the elevator. You couldn't you, you, you couldn't, couldn't even see the you couldn't even stand on the other side of your door and just wish you were inside. <laughs> you, you, had to, you had to go from the lobby, right? There were signs talking about it throughout, right? It was to the point where even the game, you couldn't gamble. What could you do in Vegas if you can't sleep, you can't drink, you can't eat, you can't gamble? <laughs> this is the worst place on earth to be, right? Um, and then they end up like giving out like vouchers so people can like at least get something to, to, to eat. That's how bad it was. And they're still reeling from it, right? A lot of it has been corrected. Um, however, there are still a lot of bad things that, 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 are, that are going on over there. From what I understand, the last I, I heard, somebody just called up their support, pretended to be an employee, and was able to get into the network. Like, a whole lot. I don't want anybody to lose their job, but that guy probably needs to lose his job yeah, if, they, if you let that happen, right? Years. Yeah, it just wasn't a good fit for him. Do you ever deal with cyber insurance? Um, me personally? Well, like, do you go on site after there's an incident? Because I know, you know, a company that, you know, had a cyber insurance mm -hmm. policy and then they send a team when something like this is going on okay. and help you manage it. Have oh, you ever been involved in that? I like haven't. I have, I've worked with people who actually have done that. And that is a, a nightmare situation as well, mm -hmm. right? Anybody here have cybersecurity insurance? No, we do, but yes. right. But even I've heard that some insurances are going on the front end, where mm -hmm. before actually giving you the insurance, mm -hmm. they'll do certain review certain components. And it is. The, they're still trying to figure out this process of how to do it. every single insurance company seems to yeah. operate in a different way. Uh -huh. But generally speaking, if, if you want cybersecurity insurance, which every one of you should have or need to have. Right, um, you would um, have to do like an evaluation of your whole like network processes. Yeah. Typically, you want to go with, like an outside person to do it. So, like, I would get like Ipris to come in and, and actually do that for you. Right? They're gonna ask questions that you need to be brutally honest with. Right? You can't muddy the waters. Mm -hmm. If they're saying, "Hey, are you using multi-factor authentication?" It needs to be yes. We are using multi multi-factor authentication on this, on this. Anytime somebody accesses this. If you say you are and you are not, and you get a, and then you, know, you have a claim, and you, you have a claim, claim. Yeah. you're not okay. Yeah. So that's why your IT person's got to, you've got to say, I've got a cyber insurance policy. Get a hold of your IT guy. He's got to go through with you because they're going to ask you, do you have um, EDR? Do you have a 24 7 SOC? Do you have MFA? And you're going, I, I don't even know what this is. <laughs> But if you mark down that you've got it because that's the only reason why they're going to give it to you mm -hmm. and you don't have it, guess what? Insurance companies are losing money, so they're going to stop losing money because they're, they're not going to pay on the price. Yeah. So if you claim and you said that you had it and you can't prove it, mm -hmm. then your claim is going to be denied. There, there, was, a, there was a big company um, that had a risk for attack. They had to have to pay insurance to travelers. Mm -hmm. Travelers paid out over $2 million. They then, in review, realized that the people never had multi-factor multi authentication mm -hmm. uh, uh, authenticated. Mm -hmm. And they actually sued the company to recover that $2 million. Wow. So, yeah, it's, so it's like you need somebody to, you know, make sure that you, you guys are answering that questionnaire out accurately. Yeah. But then, post that, you have to make sure that somebody's consistently monitoring it to make sure that nothing changes, right? Because yeah. the minute something is different from the, the from the, that questionnaire, they won't pay. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just, not, it, I've seen too many bad experiences with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so how often is a business hit with ransomware? Uh, so 43% of, of cybersecurity incidents are for small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, anybody want to take a stab at as to why? It's easier. It's easier, yeah, yeah. it's easier. Probably less controlled, or they think less controlled. Well, let's control I guess that's the easier. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. it's easier to, to, to get, you know, the CPO over here than it is to get it to the Coca Cola organization, yeah. right? It's less effort. You know, they have you know, billions of dollars that they're spending on cybersecurity infrastructure a year versus, you know, over here, maybe a couple of thousand dollars a year, right? So mm -hmm. that's another, another reason. The, the other reason is that most small and medium sized businesses are so proprietorships. Um, and so, you don't have anybody to fall back on, right? So the FBI agent, rightfully so, said you should not pay to 
get your data back. But if that meant that you no longer can be in business because you don't have the data you need, are you gonna pay it? Are you gonna take that risk? I'm gonna take the risk, I'm gonna pay it. I have no choice. I can't, I don't have anybody else to rely on. Right? My kids still need to go to private school. You know, my my you know daughter still needs to go to you know get you know get a, get a, get a car. Like, there's so much things that you have to think about as a business owner. That it's like, no, I'm just going to pay and hope for the best. Eighty five percent of all email attachments are harmful. Right? There's better ways to send and receive any sort of files and attachments. Ninety one percent of attacks are launched from a phishing attack. There are over 24,000 new malicious apps removed from the App Store daily. That was a shocking number to me. Mm -hmm. A business is hit with ransomware every 13.275 seconds, right? And we see it, right? I just Googled the other day, you know, um, you know, accountants and ransomware and this and the other, and a whole bunch of stuff came up. All of the big four account mm -hmm. firms were breached. Mm -hmm. It's scary. So what can be done about it, right? So. Mm -hmm. First off, I'll talk about just backup, right? So we mentioned backup. This isn't me pitching you to, to, to get data product or anything of that nature, uh, but this will illustrate the, the, the need, the value, and how you should look at backup, right? So interesting, interesting statistic is 60% of small businesses that are victims of cyber attack go out of business within six months. A lot of times it's just too hard to recover. This right here is probably going to be the most, one of the most important things I want you to, to take away today. This is RTO and RPO. So let's say everything is going fine. You come into work one day and your screen says that you have ransomware. Bam, ransomware is right here. You have two factors that you need to weigh it in on. One is RTO, recovery time objective. What that means is, how long can I be down? How long can that computer be, not be working? Is it five minutes? Is it an hour? Is it a day? Like, what is that upper limits of your threshold for pain, right? Some people, if you're highly transactional, you may say, hey, I cannot be down longer than three hours. That is like, after that, I'm, I'm hurting bad. Another company can say, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> We're used to doing stuff on paper. We can be down for at least a week before we feel pain. That is an individual thing that you have to think about for your organization, right? To see how long you can be down. The other point, right? So once again, ransomware is right here. You want to get up as quickly as possible to say, we want to get up an hour. So, you know, we can get up an hour. But RPO, recovery point objective, is how long ago was the last good backup point. It's great to get up an hour, but it sucks to get up an hour if you have data from two weeks ago, right? If I wanna get up an hour, I wanna get as close to that disaster. I wanna be like five minutes before that disaster happened or, so, or, or 20 minutes before that disaster happened. So like you guys might also say, you know what? If I was down for a week and it wasn't tax crunch, I can manage it. But if it's coming to the 15, <laughs> and you've got to get that stuff in, and suddenly you every single person in your company is shut down. Mm -hmm. How quickly are you going to want to get up and run it? So you've got to look at, even if you've got a backup, if it's going to take you three days to get all your data back and running, mm -hmm. and you can't do anything in that time, and it's the 13th of the month, can you afford to be down for three days? So that's what you've got to look at. Not only have I got a backup, how quickly can I recover in that event? Exactly. So RTO, RPO, very, very important. Something you need to think about, what is important. And once again, seasonally, it can change. But you have to think about worst case scenario, where do you want to be, right? So it doesn't matter if you have like a virtual environment, it doesn't matter if you host data in the cloud, it doesn't matter if it is a you know, physical environment, a hybrid. There are different ways to make sure that all of that data is backed up. Um, and so I just wanted to, to make sure that that was clear because some people say, well, you know, we don't really use, you know, this type of data or really work in this sort of method. It doesn't matter how you work. Data is still being generated. 
and data still needs to be preserved, right? And so there's different ways that we help to make sure that your data is safe and accessible. So just to show you how like our solution would, would work, right? And by our solution, generally um, anybody who's doing this sort of three to one sort of backup um, would, would work, right? So you have your computers, we're able to back them up as often as every five minutes. We're able to then do a couple of things, right? We're able to take that data, and because we can back up every five minutes, if you take a full image of everything, if your computer was to get the virus or a ransomware or just shut down or you know somebody stole it, we'd be able to bring up your data in, 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 in exactly how it looks on your current computer within minutes. We also do something called um, offsetting the data because you don't only want the data on that network, right? What if happens something crazier happens, right? What if unfortunately a flood happens? What if like, a fire happens? We had a problem in right? 2017. Most businesses were underwater. For yeah, four, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so you want data on site, but you also want it to be somewhere else secure. So what we do is we make sure that we send it to our own private data center. And then what we also do is we cross replicate it to another part of the country. So something happens to your immediate office, it's okay. We have the data in Pennsylvania. Something happens along the whole East Coast. You probably have bigger fish to fry <laughs> at that point. However, we have your data over in Utah as well. Mm -hmm. So just another visual of how it works. Everything is working well. The computer is going, it's, it's flowing. All of a sudden you get that ugly ransomware notification, but because you've been backing it up to a backup uh, device, you're able to get back working how it was prior to any sort of infection. So with this virtualization, it reduces your downtime, it's local in cloud, and then it's also going to help with, once again with your RTO and RPO. And for bonus points, anybody remember what RTO and RPO stands for? Recovery. 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 Uh, recovery. Recovery. Uh, recovery time objective, time recovery point objective. Yeah. Uh, you get bonus points. And they don't mean anything, but <laughs> you still get bonus points. Um, and so it's also important to remember that, you know, if anybody here using like Google uh, Workspace, anybody using Microsoft 365? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so that data that lives there also needs to be backed up. Because Microsoft doesn't back it up. <laughs> they don't back it up for you, right? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and the thing is that we're seeing more and more threats happening via Microsoft 365, especially after 2020, right? Because 2020, that's when COVID happened. That's when everybody started working remotely. That's when everybody's company started like changing out their exchange servers for Microsoft 365 and you know getting teams so everybody can collaborate. And there was just way there was like a 700 percent increase in utilization for Microsoft 365. And that has caused a lot of uh, bad things as well. So why, right? Why do you need to make sure that you protect, right? So Microsoft and Google, they provide for the security of the cloud, and you provide for the security within their cloud, right? So they even have a EULA, which says that they're not responsible for any data, they're not responsible, you know, if, they're, if the system is down and you lose on a million dollar contract because you can't access your data, you cannot sue them, it's all within their EULA, right? Microsoft has no liability for the deletion of customer data or personal data as described in this section. And to, 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 to make it look, uh, you know, so to make more sense, this is Microsoft over here. They're going to be responsible for hardware failure, right? So if their servers malfunction or whatever, and they have to put new servers in, that's on them. That's what they're responsible for. Software failures, natural disaster, power outages, right? They have redundant power uh, supplies. They have uh, redundant um, uh, 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 internet lines and feeds, dedicated internet. Any of that stuff goes awry, Microsoft is responsible. But in terms of the stuff that's inside of it, right? That's on you guys, right? Or if you have a managed service provider like Impress, that's on them. They're gonna put, so you're responsible for human error, right? Programmatic errors, malicious insiders, external hackers, viruses, and malware. 
So people don't realize that Microsoft 365 can't get hit with ransomware. With, with Microsoft 365, if you're using um, like, you know, the SharePoint and Teams of that nature, and you have everything that collaborates, so we make a change here, a change that's there. If you get a virus and the virus or ransomware gets into that, that SharePoint file, it can traverse everything, right? And so you can get pretty much uh, either corruption or you can get ransomware even in that data set. Human error, I mean, this happens all the time. Anybody ever get the, the alert that you're like 99% at capacity, you get to the field space? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get it all the time. I wait to the last possible day and then I just delete everything. And then I always remember like a month later, like, yeah, I think I deleted that thing too. I was supposed to delete that, <laughs> right? But it's too late, right? Um, it's gone. And so that happens, right? And it's not sinister or anything like that. It's just, you just deleting everything because you finally decided to do it because you were 99% full. Um, there's been situations where people leave a firm, they go to another company, they try to take all their data, and they try to delete everything, right? They change their book of business, their customers, um, you know, all sales data, and they try to delete it so they don't leave any like trail, so they don't help the, the, the former company out, they can take their business to the new company. And so the, we see a lot of that happening. So backing up that type of information protects the company as well. Um, so what else should we be thinking about, right? I know we talked about a lot today. I know the FBI was scared how to meet too. Um, but what else, right? Deep fake technology, anybody familiar with deep fake technology? Deep fake is so scary because what deep fake is, is using computer algorithms and software to manipulate what you're seeing. So this is Obama talking. This is this gentleman right here talking. This computer program, which is mapping his actions and his talking and putting it on President Obama. When you look at this right here, I, I, I had no idea he was in this movie. I must be watching the whole movie the wrong with my whole life. But if you see, if you Google deep fake videos, and you can go and you can see people taking people's faces and putting it from here to here, changing their voice, and everything like that's insane. It is at its infancy. Mm -hmm. Now think about it, right? What did we talk about earlier? You get an email, hey, I need you to, you know, send uh, half a million dollars to this new vendor. We say, call them up, right? Get them on a Zoom call. Imagine there's gonna be a point where you try to use me on a Zoom call and you're gonna be talking to him. You're gonna be talking to him, but you're really talking to him. Mm -hmm. That's a scary thought, right? Mm -hmm. But it's getting so realistic. It's getting so fluid, right? These are the things you just have to think about, right? So it's not only just call somebody, but maybe there is a, just an internal method that you guys communicate to verify somebody's true intent. Hey, if I ever need this, this is what I'm going to tell you. Yeah, so like my family, we have a best word. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and and you don't tell anybody else, mm -hmm. and if anybody deviates from that, you automatically know that this is not right. There's the fake voice technology, right? This is scary, right? Because once again, this is you calling to verify and validate, and somebody is able to answer the phone and sound just like your boss. Mm -hmm. Anybody know what voice print is? So we all have a unique voice print, like, mm -hmm. just like a fingerprint. Mm -hmm. So when I call my bank, I have TD Bank North. If I call from my phone number, and I, and somebody picks up, and they hear my voice, it automatically, automatically verifies who I am. I don't have to answer any questions, I can just start talking, and they will start helping me. Very convenient, but very scary, right? <laughs> right? That they understand that they have my voice signature and pegged. These bad guys are able to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's why when people call my phone, I don't recognize the number, and uh, I pick up, I actually try to disguise my voice. Even though it sounds stupid, these people are trying to get uh, voice samples mm -hmm. from people, right? It's scary. It's something we have to think about. I wouldn't like over like do it. I don't want you to sound like that being like, hello, what was this? <laughs> no need for all that, but um, it is something that I think about whenever I get these calls. I, 
I think I read something that says even if you try to fake, there's something in your voice that can pick up the real voice. Uh, uh, yeah. It doesn't pick up the the, you know, the, 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 yeah. the disguise. I'll probably just, I'll probably just, just goes to the room. Room. You're probably laughing at me as I say my voice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and so, like, there's a ton of stuff going on, right? If you just Google, you know, uh, defake voice technology, right? There was a mother who got a call from scammers, right? Similar to, like, my sister, uh, sister story. Um, but they put the daughter on the phone. Mm-hmm. Allegedly, it sounded like her, her daughter. The woman ended up paying so, I forgot how much, thousands of dollars to these kidnappers, supposed kidnappers, only to realize her daughter came in the door, like, 15 minutes later. Right? It's a real thing. It's a, it's a real thing. And then there's AI driven malware, right? Um, technology, once again, you can leverage technology to be able to um, be more powerful in bad ways than ever before, right? It's very, very effective. It thinks for itself. It can solve the captures. I can't even solve the captures a lot of times, right? You have to like draw, uh, you know, something around a cat, or you have to say, you know, this bus, which blocks are these buses in? You have to put it. And it keeps making me try again and again and again. So I don't know how they're able to solve it and a real human can't solve it, but they're able to solve it. Hmm. I'm sorry for my ignorance. What is capture? Huh? Um, sorry for my ignorance, but I don't know. So you ever like try to go to a website, you put your password in, and it says, we need to verify you're a human. So it says, uh, tap all the boxes that you see. Sidewalks. Or sidewalks. Oh, 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 yeah. Right? Uh-huh. Yeah. And you're like, is that like tire in that? Screw it or not, yeah. I can yeah. really start trying to magnify it and everything. It's just like the worst. Mm-hmm. That, that's what the caption is. So it's a way to try to uh, limit the bots and AI and things of that nature, but mm-hmm. it's not working that well. Okay. It just Thank creates you. more chaos for us. Um, it's able to skin social media to find contacts, and it's able to create more customized messaging for you, right? And it knows how to target you, right? So it's pretty crazy. Then we have Chat, chat GPT. Mm-hmm. Uh, luckily, it's getting stupider and stupider um, ever since its inception. All right, um, it's not able to be as quick as it used to be. However, we 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 do see that that's it's going to be changing as it gets uh, uh, into the, the different iterations of it. So, one of the things is they they have put a bunch of restrictions on Chat GPT and what it could it, could it do. And you know, for the most part, it, it worked. But ChatGPT is so smart that it was able to trick its own set of rules to be able to do something it's not supposed to do. Like it like hired somebody from like TaskRabbit to do a task. And since it wasn't Chat ChatGPT doing the task, and it was something that ChatGPT hired, it was able to go through. Mm-hmm. That's scary. Like. Like, I can't kill somebody, but I can hire a hitman to kill somebody, mm-hmm. but I didn't kill somebody, right? This is kind of, kind, of, kind, of, kind of creepy, kind of scary, but this is the world that we're living in, right? Um, anybody here still work in the office? Anybody work from home? Well, like hybrid. Hybrid, hybrid. So, so we're seeing more and more food workplaces as well, uh, where people are working you know, two days in the office, two days at home, or vice versa. Um, and, you know, there's a lot to, to have to think about with that as well. Because when you're on your own network, is your own network typically as secure as your company's network? No. Right? And you have typically a lot of people on that network, right? You have kids, grandkids, husbands, like, I mean, all these different people doing different activities, right? Sometimes they may you meet, even catch a kid on your computer, your work computer, you're like, hey, hey you can't be on that work computer, right? There's all these different factors that, 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 that happen. Um, and, and so we have to think about that, right? How can we make sure that we're still protecting the company, protecting the organization? while still be able to, to give you the flexibility of having a hybrid schedule. IoT, Internet of Things. Um, there are 11.2 billion connected devices today. By tomorrow, it's going to be over 20 billion connected devices. In this room alone, there's probably 30 different connected devices. If you have the Apple Watch or a Samsung Watch, um, Apple phone, whatever, uh, all those things are connected devices. Um, it's even to the point now where they have connected, um, like interesting stuff, like they have like a Wi-Fi lawnmower, right? That's kind of scary, like the poor squirrels. Um, <laughs> they have <laughs> they have Wi-Fi diapers, I found out. Did you know that? Anybody know that? What? Pampers. How does they, that work? So, <laughs> I, 
I didn't say I looked into it. <laughs> well, I have a two year old. I was good. Mm-hmm. But it tells you, it gets you alert when the kid uses the bathroom. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, that's crazy, yeah. right? Right. It's, it's just like insane. Like, like I, I, as I was about to purchase, I'm like, am I being a bad parent? And I decided that I wasn't going to do it. But I really wanted to. And then you put it, you put that on Instagram. Uh, <laughs> 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 Look at my son did. Look at my He's regular. Oh. <laughs> but, um, I, I just bought like a new stove uh-huh. um, and they told me do you want it with wi-fi or no yeah, is it connected mm-hmm. to the wi-fi and so i'm like the stove yeah. i mean i'm supposed to be there to cook you know uh-huh. like what would i need wi-fi no it will like, alert you when yeah, the crazy thing. Like, um, uh, uh, like, how much he said? Yeah. <laughs> how much he <laughs> said? Technology is crazy. Yeah, those yeah. stoves are. I'm, like, I'm a tech guy. I look into that. Like, oh. Can you imagine a stove telling yeah. you if food is ready? Come over. Yeah. It'll actually cook it. Yeah. You can, I, look, I look into <laughs> that as well. It, it, it'll keep the food like at a, at a safe temperature during the day. Like it'll keep it like cool enough. And so if you want it to keep on at a certain time, you can turn your stove on mm-hmm. remotely. And by the time you get home from work, the dinner room will be cooked. Wow. Right? But you have to remember, as you introduce more of these IoT things into <laughs> your life, they are, it, is, it does add more layers uh, of uh, the ability to, to be compromised, right? Yeah. Because you have to think, how often are there updates on the stove? Right. These Wi Fi light bulbs, how yeah. often are, are, are there updates, right? When these vulnerabilities happen, how often is it updated, right? So there's a lot of things to kind of think about with that. Well, then I, I have uh, been taking some other cybersecurity courses that, and the people said, you know, those people teaching mm-hmm. always said, I am not in social media. I don't recommend social media. You don't want to have a smart TV. You don't want to have a smart anything in your house mm-hmm. because the more you have, the more you have. It, but it's, it's funny it's because you, you get to the point where you want to be tech savvy. You want to. Mm-hmm. You know, but so if you say you don't use something, people like, oh, you mm-hmm. know, so and so yeah. is afraid of technology. There's mm-hmm. just a difference between being afraid and being um, conservative in terms of protecting your identity. Like, I think coming to right. things like, yeah. like like this and just hearing like what people are saying and, you know, the new information that's coming out, I think that right there will help guide you. I don't think you have to like limit like you know social media and mm-hmm. not getting like the, the, the tech. Like you just have to be smart and responsible with it. Mm-hmm. And I think that it, it's not that it's not that big of a mm-hmm. of an issue. So, rounding third base, guys. We're almost finished. We're almost home, right? So, what do you what can you do? Number one, always understand that you are a target whether you're online or you're offline. It does mm-hmm. not matter. You have the ability to be targeted and to compromise. Um, make sure that you have some policies and procedures written down, right? Of like how you handle everything about your organization, right? I'm talking about how you handle um, customer sensitive information, right? How how do you report if there is, you know, been a, a potential like uh, breach or, um, you know, personal identifying information is found where it's not supposed to be? Like, have all of that laid out. Don't make it a guesswork type of thing. I'm going to play training. If you took employees out of the equation, right, 99.9% of the times you're going to run safe. The minute you add the the people element, that's when things go haywire. So make sure that we're training, training, training. Uh, I like how you said that at your company, they do um, the the, the training for emails, things of that nature. So you are aware to, 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 to know what to look for, right? That's important. You spend the time with your people, you go with these types of things, and then you reduce the, 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 the amount of risk that you have. Password management, I, I use a password manager. I, I recommend it for a front as well. I also use like the password manager that comes with like Apple. Excuse me, uh, it, is, it is pretty secure. Um, and I, I, I have not had a problem with it thus far. Use multi-factor authentication, right? That right there is key. Once again, it is very annoying, but it is very, very powerful. Make sure that, that it is an app based um, uh, MFA as opposed to like SMS based um, uh, um, MFA. The SMS ones or ones that come to it as like a text, yes. those can be spoofed easily. The ones that are app based, not so much. So, how do you know how do you? I mean, one comes in a text and the other one? 
Uh, so one comes in like a like, like a text format. Yes. The other one will be like through an app like like Okta or, or like Duo. Duo. Okay. Um, okay. Duo. Who do you who, who do you guys usually to be use? Yeah, so you can use the Microsoft Microsoft one okay. as well. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're just getting a text, it's not going to be as secure. Because also with that, you can have your biometrics, you scan them with your thumbprint, then you get in, then you generate a code that changes all the time. It's a text coming in, it gets spoofed. It's, it's, it's like they're finding 2FA, two, two which is just a text, is what they used to use, but even Microsoft now are saying on all Microsoft uh, 365, they're probably going to force people to go multi factor authentication, which is by using that. Yeah, but what happens if your email is compromised? Then, you, then you're just giving the bad guy <laughs> the code. So that's why you really want to have it outside of your computer environment by coming to it with the, with the app uh, on your phone. It generates a code that changes every 60 seconds. So that's much more difficult. Mm-hmm. But if they send a code to your email, yeah. the hackers right. get the email, guess what? You've just given them the keys. Mm-hmm. So never leave your device unattended. Right, so I go to the dentist all the time, and I go to check in with the receptionist, and she's never there. She's always in the back, and I look over and I see all this just information on the computer. I give somebody the opportunity to take people's information, put a heart, a, a, a thumb drive in. There's so many things you can do in that five seconds or ten seconds. Uh, make sure that if you're leaving your area, make sure that you are locking your computer. Right. Even if it's going to the bathroom or going over to a colleague's desk, lock your computer. Be careful what you click on, right? Because people are your greatest risk. I'm uh, sure if you walk around on a Friday at like four o'clock, you see something like this, right? They probably just click on something they shouldn't have clicked on, right? Like, damn it. And now, now they have to make the decision do I tell somebody or do I just close the computer? And hopefully when I come in on Monday, it's all fixed, right? Close the computer, right? That's what we do. No. <laughs> <laughs> If you see weird emails and you know that they don't work right, like you can see like characters mm-hmm. and just weird looking, you know, information. Mm-hmm. What do you do with what should you do with those or should you do anything? So in, in, in my organization, if we get those, we actually we have a program where we send it to. Them. So we don't open it, we don't click it or whatever, but by doing that, it makes the whole company aware and it goes onto your master list. But it, it's a little bit different. Um, I typically know which emails that I want to click on, and anything else, no, unfortunately, I just don't click on it. Whether, like, I don't even click on it to see or hover over, like, I don't know this person, I don't know why they're emailing me, I'm just gonna either delete it and move past it. I don't typically make interact it. Interact with it at yeah, all. Yeah, I don't interact. Because, like, 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 like Kyle said, like, sometimes you can hover over it and that can trigger something. I just, hmm. yeah, that's but just me. Though. Some people will do the whole quarantine thing and do this and the hmm. other. Me, I just no, don't know this person, don't know this person, don't know this person. Okay, I'm expecting, I know this person, we interact, and click on that, and it's fine, good to go. I just wonder what the best thing to do, like if you record it or just not. I mean, I don't know, well, it, it, but you it, know what I mean. It really depends. Like, the only time it's really recording is like, typically if you're like a company network, you typically report it and then IT will like, investigate it. And sometimes they'll say, nope, this is a legit email and it's safe, or other times they'll just, Put on like a, a, a blacklist so it, that things from that email can't come through again. So they'll do stuff like that. Okay, thanks. Um, let me just move along with this. Um, antivirus and malware protection, right? Obviously, once again, from the 80s, we use something to say the core belief that we know in terms of protecting ourselves is getting antivirus on the computer. Uh, mobile device policy more and more people are working off of their phones. Right, you're in the supermarket now. You get emails. You're responding to the other. What type of policy do you guys have? Right, if if you have it where your phone automatically locks after like 15 seconds, <laughs> or is it making sure that we're responsible um, with, with with that data? Um, security testing and configuration. So making sure that you you have somebody consistently like checking your network and. You know, things change on networks all the time, making sure that it's being monitored um, rather than just thinking it's good until you have an issue. 
Um, and so this, right? Hmm. Everybody has a plan that's to get punched in the mouth, right? And so I look at this as probably one of the most important statements ever. I'm sure he didn't mean it to be as impactful as it is to me now. But when it comes to preparing for a disaster, preparing for these sorts of events, right? You have to keep getting a punch in the face, right? You can't say, I'm going to set set it, I'm going to set up my network, I'm going to make sure that I have you know this program, I have this, I'm, I'm good to go, and not practice what would happen if there was really a disaster situation, right? You need to make sure that you're consistently running tests. Um, but yeah, so you want to make sure that, you know, when it, as it pertains to like your, your, your network, that you are consistently uh, see, identifying changes, uh, that, that you are, you know, consistently updating, you know, who the go-to people for, and that, that they handle certain, you know, parts of the network. Um, you know, having an incident response plan, right, is, is great, but it's not good if you don't take the appropriate measures to make sure you prepare for the actual execution of utilizing incident response support. Stay on top of new tech, and continuity is big. Um, you know, as Kyle mentioned, uh, backup, 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 backup. That's what this is right here. We call it continuity because backup, you have your data, but you don't necessarily have it developed to you instantly. So with continuity, continuity, you have your data and it can be spin, spun up and utilized instantly, right? So that's the big change, right? So that's a lot. Um, you know, if you don't know where to, to, to begin or the next steps, you know, uh, Roland's about to come up and, you know, have a conversation and, uh, he's the, 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 the go-to person, right? Um, and I'm happy that he was able to bring me here to, you know, share my experiences and hopefully educate you guys somewhat. Um, but, you know, uh, QOT Roland, thank you. I know it's mid-afternoon. You guys have been here a while. All this technology jargon doesn't make sense. So I'm going to try and uh, just try and wrap it up and what affects your industry specifically and what you should be looking for. Um, very quick introduction. Um, we're going to do the introduction, go to our team, and then the top six things that you should really be looking at for CPA films. Um, one, do you guys all know about um, compliancy and how it impacts you? So that if you were to get compromised and your customer's data was exposed, then as CPAs, you could be held liable. So those were the FTC regulations that came out of June. So you should be aware of them and you should be make, making sure that you, yourselves and your firms are, are compliant. Um, why are CPA targets, um, why are the big targets for hackers? Obviously, holding your data to ransom. People, so you've got everybody's personal identifiable information. Why transfer fraud? Using your emails to scam customers. If they compromise your email, they could get all of your customers' emails. Um, they can infect your machine for a virus and then offer to clean it up, which you should never do because they're going to be the bad guys. And then your business is going to be held liable if your customer's ex um, information is exposed. So then now making sure that CPAs take extra effort to protect your company. That this is part of our team. And uh, as we've seen on a lot of the other sites, cybercrime is rocking. So we know it's in the billions of dollars there's big incentive for people to go after the data. Um, so there's six things that you want to really look at. Your access control, encryption, multi-factor authentication, information disposal. You can't just get rid of your own computer. Monitoring activity and having reliable security. Those six factors are the things that if you don't do it, not only could you lose access to your information, but you're also going to be held liable. So those are the FTC regulations. 
They're saying that somebody in your company has got to be designated to supervise your information security. You've got to conduct a risk assessment, design and implement safeguards, have your system monitored, staff trained, monitor your service providers, keep your information secure in camera, and create a written incident response plan. Most people haven't even started doing the incident response plan. And that's what both Kaseya and the FBI would say. Have that written down and make sure that you know what to do should a disaster, should a ransomware attack. And um, they also say that a qualified individual should be able to report that to your director. So security and backups, big thing we've seen. So your environment, and it becomes more difficult as people now work from home. But typically, you would have a firewall followed by a zero trust program, then a next gen antivirus. I'm going to cover that in a bit more information. And an email phishing defense program. Why is it so important? Well, number one way that people are getting hacked business email compromise. If you don't have a security system around your email, that's the number one way that you're going to be hit. And the chances are, if you've got no way of being alerted when somebody's in your email system, the chances are the bad guys are sitting there and they could be just sitting and lurking. Whether you're a one-man band, whether you're a 2,000 person organization, all they're looking for is somebody to respond to a text, to click on a link, and next minute they're in your email and they're just sitting and lurking. Um, performing the pen test, so if you've got a bigger organization, you should have a pen test to ensure that your that company's network is secure. Yeah. Just a question. There are companies that allow employees to, to use their email address for personal things. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's just a, a bad thing to, to you know. Yeah, so you can have policies that you shouldn't be doing. What, so what's even worse is when companies say you can use your company email on your home computer. Mm, some companies Big. let people do that. Mm -hmm. So they're saying you've got a personal device, mm -hmm. you've got a cell phone, you've got a, a laptop. Well, just respond to emails on your on your personal device, but that personal device has oh, no security. That's that's right, because I, I was just talking to my daughter, she got a new job, and I said, are they gonna send you a phone? And she said, no, I'm gonna just use my personal yeah. phone. So, so that's, 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 that's a problem. That's a, that's a personal device with zero security, mm -hmm. um, and there's no way of tracking. And then you click on a, a text that exposes your email password, and the guys have got your email address and they're in your system. Um, enforcing password changes, we've heard everybody talking about that and they should be changed regularly and they should be complex, more long than necessary, just complex but longer. Uh, having regularly employee training. We went to a cyber security conference with uh, Robert uh, Hedet, um, who is the fix? Uh, from Shark Tank, we went to see Cyderus, multi-billion dollar cyber security company. Number one weakness is always the employee. So if you're not doing employee training, that's the number one way of people getting ha hacked. Look at MGM. I mean, <laughs> they, they basically took somebody's LinkedIn profile and used that to chat to somebody in IT, who gave them the password to get into the system, millions of dollars plus reputation. Uh, having your secure backups offsite um, and local, and the ability to spin up. A lot of backups are just backups of data, and that's what uh, uh, Kaseya were talking about. Can you, how quickly can you restore if it's just the data? Now you've got to reinstall your operating system, your programs. It, you could be down for days or a week instead of being back up in hours. Ronald, on the previous slide, you had the automated 
a phishing defense program. Mm -hmm. Is that the, the email filtering tool for yeah. in and inbound outbound, or is that something else? Yeah, so um, the program we, we use is Graphis. There's a few out there. Mm -hmm. So it's an AI-based email filtering. So it's going to take, it's going to detect if there's any malicious content in that email, mm -hmm. it blocks it completely. If it's not malicious, but it could be spoofing. So as uh, Kyle from the FBI was talking, where people added an I, or they put a capital I instead of an L, or they uh, put an extra N or change it to a, a zero. Mm -hmm. Now what's going to happen, you're going to get a banner that comes across that says, you've never received an email from this person. But you go, well, wait a minute. We've got 20 emails and we've got email correspondence. How can it say I've never received? And that alerts you, this is somebody trying to spoof that email. Mm. It says it's coming from your boss, but it's actually, they've spoofed the email address. That's going to let you know it's got this big plan. And that's when you can say, Mark is phishing. Um, and once you do that, it's going to take it from the back end, stops you from seeing those emails. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so now we move on to zero trust. A lot of what you've heard is where programs have run on your computers because people have got a traditional antivirus program. What does an antivirus program do? It looks at what are things as known threats. And then if the system gets infected, it tries to fight against that program that is being installed. Zero Trust goes it from a different angle. It basically says, I'm going to take your computer, I'm going to whitelist these programs, and everything else I'm going to treat as, as it's not going to allow anything else to run apart from your known good programs. So what happens is that we put the system into learning mode, it runs for a while, learns your programs, then we lock it down. If you click on a link or an attachment by mistake, it just says this program can't be installed. Can't run. So you're not trying to fight against it. It just says zero trust. We're not going to allow it to run. Now, if you need to install a new program, then you simply say, put it into learning mode, let it run. And uh, then you lock it down. So zero trust is becoming the new way that everybody should have of going beyond the firewall, I want zero trust to be my number one thing to protect. What it also has is a thing called ring fencing. And why is ring fencing important? Ring fencing is important because it says a known good program tries to do something that it shouldn't. So in other words, yes, Word, yes, PDF is a legitimate program. But why is that PDF document that I open? trying to run an executable script. In other words, it's trying to run a program. Mm -hmm. A lot of the bad guys now are sending attachments, Excel spreadsheets, Word documents, PDF. You think, well, this is it's a PDF document. How can that hurt to open? Mm -hmm. The script is embedded into that PDF. As soon as you open it, it's going to start running. And that's where the ring fencing comes in and says, you know what? You're a whitelisted program that's been allowed, but you're not allowed to run this executable. We're going to block that whitelisted program from, from doing that bad thing. So it's important to have a combination of whitelisting or allow listing and then ring fencing. And then your elevation control is really just when you're saying um, if you've got, you can actually put in combination of elevation control, network access control, where you can actually say, unless this program has got it running, so if somebody gets your credentials, unless both sides can actually see it, it's going to stop that program from running. And then storage control is just so that employees, you can block it down where employees don't copy things onto thumb drives that they shouldn't be copying. So it's not really outside malicious hacker, but it's more from an internal effect of I don't want people copying into thumb drives, but you also don't want if a hacker got into your system being up being able to upload your documents to the cloud. So storage control works for that. So you 
everybody in this day and age knows about is antivirus. So your traditional antivirus only knows the things that it knows. There's a, um, something called zero, uh, zero day virus. And what happens is when a virus is released, guess what? The bad guy, the bad guys release the virus. The good guys say a new virus is up. We're going to try and find out something about it. And then they try, try and write the antidote to prevent that from running. But there's always that window of opportunity that you can get affected. So the next gen antivirus is actually learning and intelligently starting to block that. And then, as our friend from Casale was pointing out, the detection and response and the proactive threat hunting, endpoint detection and remediation. If you don't have a next gen antivirus with endpoint detection and remediation and a 24 7 security operations center, you're going to be vulnerable. Because if somebody gets past those defenses, what's going to happen? If files start changing, your antivirus is already compromised. It's too late. The endpoint detection and remediation means, wait a minute, these files are changing. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to isolate that computer. We're going to stop this, the, the, this from spreading. And then we can come in and remediate on it. Clean it up, get you back up and running. But if you don't have that on a 24-7 basis, monitoring your system, then guess what? You wake up the next morning, if, you, if your antivirus program's been compromised and you don't have that detection and remediation, you come in Monday morning, all your, bio, all your files are encrypted, encrypted and they're basically going to be holding, holding you to ransom. And at that point, you're hoping, boy, I hope my backup works. Um, so this is that advanced email program that we were talking about. The one we use is Graphics. It's, it's a Kaseya product. And basically what it's going to do is that is going to take everything off the back end. This is a dashboard that we can see that we'll share with our clients that's going to let you know how many phishing attempts. And it's basically taking all of the malicious stuff, getting rid of it. But if you're then marking something as suspicious or malicious, then it also you're training the system to say, this is suspicious. Nobody in the company should be seeing it. Get rid of it. So who, would, who in the company would see that screen? So typically, what you're going to see from an end user point of view mm -hmm. is that you're going to see a banner that comes across when you get an unknown email coming in that alerts uh -huh. you that you haven't seen it or it could be suspicious. Mm -hmm. Now on the back end, we get those alerts no. and then we share those reports with management at the end of the month to say, this is what's uh, happened for this yeah. month um, and, and this is how effective the system is working. And we can also see then if you're under more of an attack. So mm -hmm. that alerts us to, wait a minute, somebody's deliberately trying to compromise the system. We're seeing an increase in attacks. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, access control. You know, this is something that the FTC are forcing, making sure that uh, you've got an inventory of the system, password changes are enforced, and removing employee access when they leave. Do you know how many companies forget to remove employees' access when they leave? Colonial Pipeline. How they got hacked was that an ex-employee's credentials had been exposed on the dark web and the guys actually got into the system using the ex-employee because the IT guys didn't shut off their system. Hundreds of millions of dollars that it cost them simply because ex-employees weren't removed, the access wasn't removed. Um, and then zero trust application that we discussed and encryption. As CPAs, if you've got any information on your laptops, you should have uh, your you should have BitLocker encryption enabled. If you don't, if somebody steals your laptop, mm -hmm. your average Windows password can be cracked in minutes. The average IT guy can run some software and he'll be in your machine. 
having a Windows password is not secure. You've got to have BitLocker encryption because otherwise you you are going to be held accountable when that data gets lost. So, um, the great thing with threat locker as well, if it gets stolen, we can actually uh, lock it down. Um, use encrypted emails when you're sending information. And typically, you never see any personal identifiable information by email. Should all be done in a portal. If you send it by email, it's got to be encrypted. Um, because even if you've got a secure email system, if they're using Yahoo, Gmail, even your regular Microsoft 365, if it's not encrypted, it's going to be exposed. So don't let people send you tax returns or tax documents, social security numbers, anything. You've got to no personal identifiable information should be sent on email. Uh, upload your documents to a secure portal. In multi-factor authentication, you know, we've discussed that. 2FA text to your cell phone is not becoming sufficient anymore. The bad guys are getting around that. It's got to be multi-factor authentication. And that's something to think about even with your bank account. So when you go to your bank and you're logging in to do your online bank, does it send a multi-factor authentication code to your phone? Or does it allow you to log in? Or does it only allow you to do it once? So the problem is, people log into their banks, if the computer gets compromised, even if they had multi-factor authentication, but it said, trust this device, mm -hmm. the computer gets compromised, the bank guys are in your system, they've got into your bank account. Mm -hmm. Now we did have one case, small pool builder that came in. They saved their passwords in Chrome, Chrome got compromised. The bad guys got the password to the bank. Good thing is that they had two-factor authentication on their on their bank account. The bad thing is when the bad guys try to log in, it said uh, two-factor authentication code is wrong. Yes. So you know what they did? They spoofed Regions bank account, and they phoned the person. On their phone, it said regions. They answered it, and the hacker said to them, um, we phoned him from the bank. We've noticed unusual activity. We need to verify that you are the legitimate uh, person who owns this account. We're going to send you a code. Give us that code, and we, we're going to verify that it's you. They gave him the code. They then said, OK, it looks like everything's fine. You can go anyway. But what they didn't realize is if they'd just given the hackers their, their 2FA and they gave the code and the guys got into the system and they went in and they transferred $24,000 out of it. They noticed it. it was Monday morning and the money was gone. So, again, any time that there's transactions, um, financial transactions, you've really got to be suspicious. If somebody's finding you from the bank, it's better to say, I'm going to find the bank back and verify your thing. In addition to that, go into your bank account and make sure, security center, I want to be alerted anytime a credit card transaction occurs, anytime money leaves my bank account, I want to know. Because if something were to be, was to happen, you can get hold of the bank, you can stop it. If you wait for a couple of days and you don't notice it straight away, it may be too late. So that's just not just something for you guys, but also your clients to realize. Put those controls in place. Make sure that every time you log into the bank, you have to generate a code. It's a pain in the butt, but you've got to do it. Every time some money leaves the bank account, every time a credit card transaction occurs, get a text message. That way, you, the quicker you know about these things, the quicker the bank can actually get the funds from you. Quick question. Uh, let's say the bank was happening with my bank, which is uh, a big, a large bank, and they send me messages to create the multi-factor 
authentication, but I'm lazy and I'm like, oh, I don't want to have a two-step thing. If something happens to my account, can they say, we told you to have a multi-factor authentication? We recommend it and you didn't do it. Yeah, like um, use it against you or something. That can hold me against it. Yeah, so yeah. It, it, to some extent, personal accounts have got more protection than business accounts. Oh, really? So sometimes you can say, no, this was a personal account. Mm -hmm. um, business accounts, there's mm -hmm. very little. Okay. But everybody says multi factors are pain. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do all these steps. That's, that's just the environment we live in. If you don't do it sooner or later, something is going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's better to spend a few more minutes each day having security than being, com than being compromised in the money. Thank you. Yeah. So, multifactual authentication, whether it's QuickBooks, accessing the servers, SharePoint, anytime you're accessing data. Have multi factor authentication. And then when it comes to information disposal, FTCR pushing this, never just dispose of your of your computers. Um, have your hard drives shredded or smashed. Um, if you're a bigger company, you often have to have a certificate that it was disposed of. Mm -hmm. But the hackers will go through if you just send your if you just dispose of old laptops, old computers. Uh, that's when your, your data could be, could be exposed. Uh, have procedures in place, obviously shred uh, sensitive documents. Um, and uh, in, the, in the hybrid environment we work in, sometimes in an office, it's easier to control this. How do you control it when people are working from home? Uh, but it's, that's where you've got to have a company policy. You've got to shred your documents, you've got to shred your hard drive. You cannot have uh, information on your own. And then dark web monitoring. Uh, we actually offer dark web monitoring to our clients. Uh, as part of this, if you're interested, if you, we can't do it for Gmail and Yahoo, but we can do it if you've got a company domain where we can run a free dark web scan for you. What that's going to tell you is, is your information on the dark web? So, uh, uh, inside one of the folders, we've got a, a flyer that has the uh, option to do a dark web scan. We can run that for you at no cost. Uh, so you just go to scan the, the QR code. Uh, we can also do a, a free pen test if you want. But the dark web scan is going to let you know is your information on the dark web. Now, can you get rid of it off the dark web? Mm, no, not so easy. But what you can do. If your information is on the dark web, if you've got a password that you're currently using, then you know you've been compromised and you can put things into place to change it instead of waiting for the bad guys to actually do Because the chances are the bad guys are in, in your system already. Now what you've got to do is get them rid of that. And that would be, hey, wait a minute, my email's been compromised. Change your password and then log into your control center to see, hey, wait a minute, they've had access to the back end, and that's where they put in forwarding rules, deletion rules to stop you from knowing that they've been sitting in the system. So the dark web scan is really important. Um, tracking activity, uh, threat blockers, storage control, that'll also let us know if somebody's trying to upload or download things that they shouldn't be doing. And, uh, Computer files should be monitored with endpoint detection and remediation backed by that 24-7 software. So if your company doesn't do that already, it's something that you should inquire about. One, do I have cyber security insurance? Two, do I have endpoint detection and remediation? And do I have 24-7 software monitoring it should something happen? And um, your organization should be monitored by somebody else able to track anything that's going wrong because the last thing you want to do is wait until Monday morning to discover being hit with ransomware and everything's been shut down. What do we do now? You never want to be in that situation. And we see it all the time. Um, we've seen CPA firms, uh, uh, the 
increase on the tax on the CPA uh, over the last couple of years have, has been rampant. So be aware, know that you are under attack and start putting things in place to protect yourself. Um, so basically, in conclusion, um, start taking proactive steps now and do this tabletop exercise. What is a tabletop exercise? It's really sitting down with the IT guys and going, what happens in the case of a ransomware attack? What is going to happen in the case of a flood? What should happen if the whole place burns down? That tabletop exercise really takes you through those high catastrophic ideas, put procedures in place, and then test. So I know it's been a long day. Um, but I thank you all for attending. Do we have any questions? So, so the thing is, when you send an email, it's going through three or four different servers before it gets to the engineer. So, emails can be intercepted. Secondly, if you're sending an email, to somebody who's got, say, Yahoo. If Yahoo's servers are compromised, which they've been compromised many times over the past year, then the bad guys have got it. So the only way to make sure it's secure is by sending an encrypted email. So you've got to have uh, a higher level Microsoft account, like an E3 account, not your standard or basic account that enables encryption. And then you can send it encryption. That way, it's only when the person on the other side then receives it that he can get it. But um, emails, it's just not, it's it's not a secure way of sending any information. And when you send an encrypted email, they only last three months. They don't keep it for long. So you want to go back and look at previous conversation. There is somebody sending you information. You ask them all these questions in January, and they wait for September to send back to you. You don't get that. Sure, but again, it's all how sensitive is it? So if you're looking at a general email, not to worry. But if I'm going to be sending uh, bank account information, social security number, credit card information, I wouldn't use email at all. Get people to upload it. Tax documents, get them to upload. Right, but there's a lot of time you ask questions and don't respond. Mm -hmm. Always, so it's either body of the email content or not your content. Um, okay, so, so, you, so you recommend using the encrypted email? Encrypted email is the best. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so if you want to sign up for the dog quick scan, go ahead and do it. We we'll also offer free pen test. And um, if you're interested in your firm having uh, compliance, uh, we can do that as well. So in other words, the FTC regulations that come up, if you're not sure what they mean, if you're not sure what it means to be compliant, we can actually uh, run those compliance programs for you and make sure that you're always compliant. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.